I work in the Deep Sea Laboratory of Ifremer in France and have not so far been involved directly in research on Indian Ocean ridges, but most of my activity has been focused on hydrothermal vents of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and I've been looking at life cycle and larval dispersal and connectivity of some of the species there. And we are interested in the future in comparing the functioning of vent ecosystem from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and Indian Ocean. And in this presentation, I will briefly introduce what is connectivity, and then provide an overview of what is currently known advance of Indian ridges. And finally, I will show different approaches of connectivity that have been that have not been so far used in the Indian Ocean and taking some example from other ridge. Next, next slide, please. So one long lasting question at Vance is how can Vance species persist in time in a discontinuous and locally ephemeral habitat? Most benthic marine species have a pelagic phase during which migrants are exchanged between populations, and this pelagic phase occurs early in the, in the life cycle at the larval stage, which means that most of the exchanges between populations are made through larvae. At Vance, the fate of larvae in the water column may allow population persistence both locally through self-recruitment on the site of origin and at distant site if the larvae are able to travel and reach those sites. And this will define how distinct populations are connected, and this connection will depend on many factors, including larval biology, deep sea currents, topographic barriers, etc. So we say that when populations function as metapopulation, which is a network of specially distinct populations that are connected through the migration of larvae. Next slide. An uh, understanding connectivity between population may help identify populations that produce many larvae and that are capable of reaching uh, other sites, and these are called source populations. They are important uh, for the long-term persistence of the species, as they will contribute to the supply of colonists. And sink population, on the contrary, are defined as populations that are not producing many larvae or larvae are constrained in their dispersal and these populations are not contributing much to the connectivity network. So identifying such populations will give a better idea of the main dispersal corridors and the structure of the connectivity ne network, and in the end, help in the identification of areas that should be preserved in priority in a conservation perspective. Next slide. Here, I would like to make a brief point on the multiple processes that operate in connectivity. Approaches to understand connectivity are multiple and provide information at different levels, targeting some of these processes, and this is important to understand how they are related to better evaluate connectivity. So, larval transport in the blue box is the translocation of a larvae from one point to another point, and it reflects a wide range of behavioral and physical mechanisms, such as advection or diffusion, uh, which are variable and operates at different scales. Larval dispersal in the gray box, green box considers the spreading of the larvae from the spawning source to the settlement site, and it includes larval transport, but is also influenced by the spawning that initiates dispersal and settlement. And both these stages include processes that can significantly influence the chances of a larvae to reach a settlement site. And finally, connectivity in the orange box is the exchange of individuals among uh, geographically separated population, and it also includes post-settlement events, this, the survival, the growth, and the sexual maturation of migrants. And that reflects the fact that the sletcher has actually entered the population and contributes to local demography and gene flux. Next slide, please. So there are different approaches to estimate connectivity. Each of them provide information at different levels and they have their own limitations. Ideally, they would be carried uh, combined to integrate the complexity of the processes driving connectivity. So estimation of larval transport can be done through direct in situ observations, but this is quite challenging in the deep sea. And more and more often, modeling approaches are used to simulate uh, larval traje trajectories. Origin assignment methods using biogeochemical tags or uh, genetic parentage analysis may provide information on the whole dispersal process from the initial release to the arrival 
in a new population, but these methods require extensive knowledge on the potential signatures of a diversity of populations. And genetic approaches are most often used since they do not require to capture the larvae themselves, but we have to keep in mind that they integrate processes over several generations, uh, incorporate evolutionary processes, and this may not reflect the connectivity at an ecologically meaningful temporal scale if they are used alone. Next slide, please. So connectivity affects ecosystem in many different ways. At the level of population, it is one of the main driver of population expansions or reductions through the supply of new settlers. At the level of species, connectivity influences the distribution of genetic diversity, which may lead to local adaptations, and it also drives modification in the distribution area of species. And at the community level, it contributes to the resilience and recovery capacity through the provision of colonies that may be a key species in terms of ecosystem functioning. And more generally, it contributes to the diversity and dynamics of the whole ecosystem. So now I will try to summarize recent knowledge on the connectivity of species inhabiting hydrothermal vents along Indian ridges. Uh, compared to other rich systems, exploration efforts on Indian ridges are more recent and the number of known active vents supporting biological commun communities is relatively low considering the extent of the spreading system, which is more than 16,000 kilometers. And to my knowledge to date, 11 vent fields are known and harbor faunal communities that have been described to various extents and which are shown here. The location 21 on the southeast Indian Ridge has not been visually identified, but then barnacles have been collected using a toad system there. About 80 active vents are currently listed in the Interridge database developed by State Beaulieu, and which includes the 11 I just mentioned, and other sites that are uh, known from their um, the signature of their plume in the water column. And, in addition, 200 sites are predicted based on spreading rates of Indian ridges, which means that nearly 300 active vents potentially supporting vent communities are existing in the Indian Ocean. Next slide. So Indian vent communities are visually dominated by a few large sized species that often have chemosymbiotic symbionts, and which is a similar in terms of uh, community um, structure to what is known in other regions of the world. One of the major inhabitants of Indian vents are the shrimps Rimicaris kairi. They form very dense populations near fluid exits at several vent sites. The Marianactis anemone are also a major components of this site. Other large include gastropods, the scaly food gastropod, Chrysomalon squamiferon, that is only known from the Indian Ocean. Alviniconca snails, Ostinogria crabs, Batimodulus mussels, and Neolepas barnacles. And today there are about 70 macrofaunal species that have been reported for the 11 known uh, sites with different species assemblages at each locality. Next slide, please. So most species inhabiting uh, known Indian vents are not, reported, uh, are not reported from other rich systems, and Indian vent communities form a separated biogeographic province. And this has been shown in several studies, including very recently when new sites uh, discovered in the southwest Indian ridge were also included in the analysis. However, at the genus level, Indian species share many similarities with vents on the Mid-Atlantic ridge in the Western Pacific and on the East Kotia ridge, and um, this view of the position of the Indian Ocean uh, vent communities in the biogeographical distribution of vents is evolving continuously as new vents are discovered. And now uh, there is increasing evidence supporting a scenario where multiple connections have occurred through time between the Indian vents and those in other biogeographic provinces. And this is challenging uh, previous hypothesis uh, of the Indian Ocean being a dispersal corridor for vent fauna between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Next slide. 
As I mentioned earlier, species composition varies across Vanfield, which may depend on two main drivers, species connectivity, but also habitat suitability for new, new settlers. So Vanfields in the central Indian ridge, which are shown here, harbor most of the emblematic Indian van species, including the symbiotic harboring species that are at the basis of food webs. So remakery streams are reported in large population on the central Indian uh, vent ridge, as well as uh, Austinodic gray crabs, whereas other species are abundant at some sites only and may be present in smaller population or haven't been reported at other sites. Next slide. Sites of the southwest ridge have similar species, but large populations of Remicaris shrimps have not been reported so far, and Alvini conca snails were thought to be completely absent until the recent rediscovery of a small population at uh, Tianqing Van Field, and they are, however, not reported so far further west. Next slide, please. The recent description of the communities of the Pelagia site on the southeast ridge shows that they are very similar to those of the Kairi and Solitaire sites on the central Indian ridge, which is perhaps not surprising given their close proximity. And next slide. And finally, dense Rimikara shrimp population have been recently described on the Carlsberg, Carlsberg ridge, uh, along with uh, Ostinogria crabs, whereas bivalves, snails and barnacles have not been reported so far. So next slide. So connectivity has been studied in some of these dominant species for which samples were available from various sites using genetic approaches. I will briefly introduce here four examples. All of them have been uh, used, have used the CO1 mitochondrial gene to infer population genetics. So the first is the snail Alvinin conca maris indica. Connectivity was studied between three sites of the central Indian ridge. Uh, the right figure shows the haplotype network where different colors denote the site at which a given haplotype, so a, a, a given genetic type is found. And this shows that whole haplotypes are mixed among sites and this indicates that all populations are connected and exchange migrants at various levels. And um, with the new discovery, the population newly discovered at other ridge, uh, this pattern could maybe uh, uh, be changed in the future uh, if other sites are included. Next slide, please. Here is an example of the scaly food gastropod. Connectivity has been evaluated between sites of the central Indian ridge and those of the southwestern ridge. And the haplotype network separates population from the long key vent field from those of Tian Chen and the central Indian ridge vents. And this suggests that scaly foot uh, gastropod populations at Longki have low or no migrant exchange with population on the east, and that dispersal barriers may occur along the southwestern ridge, perhaps due to the large transform fault that exists between Tiancheng and Longki. Next slide. Here I show together haplotype networks of both Ostinogria crabs and Batimodiolus mussels because they show similar patterns of high connectivity between van sites on the central Indian ridge and the southwestern ridge. There seems to be no dispersal barriers for these two species. And this contrasts with what is observed for the scaly foot gastropod. And this means that species uh, specific factors are also controlling migrant exchange and point at the importance of also understanding larval biology and dispersal. And for that, this requires other approach that so far, in my knowledge, have not been used for species of the Indian ridge. And I will now give some example of these other approaches that can be used. Next slide, please. So whether a larva is successfully dispersed from its birthplace to the location where it will requite depends on the processes of its early life. Here you have the typical life cycle of many benthic species with the larval phase that comprises three stages here in blue uh, with important biological and environmental factors that operate and, and that significantly affect the fate of the dispersing larvae. And this framework points at the key drivers of larval dispersal that act at each stage and for which it is important to gather knowledge to better understand dispersal and eventually use this information in biophysical modeling. Next slide. 
So here I give a first example of the empirical data that are needed to better understand population connectivity and also to help uh, interpretation of connectivity patterns obtained from uh, genetic studies. So in our laboratory, we are studying the life cycle of the Rimicaris exoculata shrimp. Uh, it lives on the mid-Atlantic ridge and is the sister species of Rimicaris cari in the Indian Ocean. And Rimicaris exoculata is also very similar to Rimicaris cari regarding its ecology. So for Rimicaris exoculata population, they are, genetic, they are not genetically structured, which means that they are expected to disperse widely and exchange a lot of migrants. But until recently, we had no information about its reproduction. For example, we didn't know when and where females were spawning, which may have important implications if we want to preserve source population, for example. So we have studied reproduction and early stages of the species, and we found that the species was probably reproducing seasonally and that the larval stage had an initial lecithotrophic phase, which may affect their uh, larval phase. Uh, next slide, please. Sampling larvae in situ also um, allows to get information on the actual distribution of larvae in situ. Um, um, since, uh, um, sorry, besides looking, I made a mistake. Besides looking uh, at reproduction, the actual observation of larvae in the environment is also important. And uh, it's however very challenging because the larvae are extremely small and the pelagic habitat is very uh, large. And here I'm showing some of the instruments that have been used to collect larvae, such as sediment traps, large volume autonomous sampling pumps, and the cypress collection system that is so far the instrument that has allowed to screen the largest volume of water. And on the uh, on, below are some examples of larvae that we collected with the salsa pump um, uh, and that is uh, developed uh, at Iframer. So next slide. Don't, so with this uh, uh, tool to sample larvae, we can collect information on the actual distribution of larvae in situ. And since larval stages are collected, they also can be used for assignment methods. And if environmental parameters are surveyed along with larval sampling, as this can be done with the Cypress system, for example, then information on interactions between larvae and their environment can be obtained. And here I illustrate uh, with an example showing how larvae found in the water column, they are show, shown in the row C in the graphs, changed uh, following an eruption on this specific rise uh, with um, completely different species occurring in the larval pool after the eruption, which directly affected the recruitment on the bottom, which is shown in the row A and B. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, empirical data can also be obtained from the culture of deep sea larvae. This has rarely been done given the difficulties in reproducing deep sea condition in the laboratory. I provide here two examples. On the left is the example of the culture of embryos of the tuborum riftia pachyptila using pressure vessels and which allowed to observe early embryonic development, estimate optimal growth condition and developmental rates and buoyancy of the embryos all of which provide important information for modeling approaches. And the left example shows uh, recordings of larval swimming behavior uh, with larvae that were captured with uh, pumps around van sites. Next slide, please. And finally, I wanted to finish with biophysical modeling, which is developing more and more to get estimates of larval dispersal and population connectivity. Uh, I chose here an example where biophysical modeling has been combined with genetic estimates to infer potential scenarios of connectivity. And this is the example of patimodulus muscles along the mid-Atlantic ridge. There are four species that have been identified and genetic analysis showed, uh, this is the um, uh, right top um, graph showed that uh, the exchange of migrants are high within the distribution areas of each of these species. However, simulation of larval dispersal using modeling approach and focused on the northern site where the species Batimodulus azoricus occur failed to connect a van site within this zone and to reconcile 
genetic uh, connectivity patterns with what was predicted with modeling approach. Uh, the authors hypothesized the existence of intermediate sites that would support other muscle population and uh, that would allow stepping stone uh, dispersal throughout distant sites. Next slide. So I would just finish with a few brief conclusion. So exploration of the Indian Ridge is only starting and uh, more effort, uh, effort should be continued on exploration and biodiversity inventor inventories to be able to study uh, connectivity. Empirical observation on, on the life cycle and larval biology of key species uh, are needed to better interpret uh, genetic patterns and they may also provide inform important information uh, that will allow parameterization of models uh, and then uh, feed these modeling approaches. And uh, I thank you for your attention.